Thank you all for coming uh, to what promises to be a very interesting and important panel uh, on intersectional approaches to animal law that incorporate critiques of racism, colonialism, heteronormativity, and patriarchy. Um, we have a couple of fantastic speakers today. Um, Manisha Dekha will speak first. She is an associate professor at the University of Victoria Faculty of Law. Her research interests include critical animal studies, feminist theory, law and culture, animal law, and bioethics. Her work has been published in Canada and internationally, and her animal-related work has been published in numerous law journals, including the Hastings Women's Law Journal, the Wisconsin Journal of Law, Gender and Society, Ethics in the Environment, the Animal Law Review, the Journal of Animal Law, and the Journal of Critical Animal Studies. Professor Decca received her BA from McGill University, her LLB from the University of Toronto, uh, and her LLM from Columbia University. Uh, in 2008, she held the Fulbright Visiting Chair in Law and Society at NYU. Uh, Professor Decca has taught her seminar, Animals, Culture, and the Law at NYU and the U University of Victoria. Uh, she has also taught courses in bioethics, personhood and the law, uh, feminist legal theories, administrative law, uh, property, and legal process. She has a forthcoming book on post-colonial feminism and animal law that will be published next year. Hopefully. A few years, okay. We'll have to wait a little bit longer. Um, Claire Jean Kim is Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of California at Irvine. Uh, Dr. Kim teaches graduate and undergraduate courses on race, multiculturalism, minority politics, social movements, immigration, and human-animal studies. Her forthcoming book, Race, Species, and Nature in a Multicultural Age, will be published next year uh, by Cambridge University Press. Uh, and it examines the intersection of race and species in impassioned disputes over how immigrants of color, racialized minorities, and native people use animals in their cultural traditions. Dr. Kim has also written numerous journal articles and book chapters, and she's the recipient of a grant from the University of California Center for New Racial Studies, and she's been a fellow at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, and the University of California Humanities Research Institute. Uh, Dr. Kim is an associate editor of American Quarterly, uh, which is an interdisciplinary journal of American studies, uh, and she recently co-edited a special issue of American Quarterly entitled Species, Race, Sex. Um, so please join me in welcoming them. Thank you so much, Matthew, for that lovely introduction. And I'd like to thank uh, Liberty and all the conference organizers for having us here. It's just a pleasure to be with you. So the title of my talk is called The Perils of Parallel Thinking in Animal Law Advocacy. So I want to make three points here today. The first is just to um, do some theoretical explanation of what we mean by intersectionality for the panel, and then to talk about how species um, can be seen as part of intersectional theory, as part of what I'm calling an intersectional matrix. The second point, then, after explaining the theoretical background, when it, what the theory of intersectionality has to offer us, is to consider how um, that type of analysis is largely absent in animal advocacy, and how the more prominent type of um, analysis is what we may call parallel thinking rather than intersectional. And then in point three, to talk about um, you know, what may be the problems of parallel thinking in terms of uh, this idea of coalition building, of seeing uh, uh, connections between different types of oppressions and um, explain that with respect to oppression parallels, trait parallels, and the implications of the types of features of parallel thinking to personhood projects in law. Okay, so the first point, just to explain this theory of intersectionality and to see how species difference might fit into this matrix. So intersectional thinking can be attributed to um, various strands of feminist thinking. So I've got critical race feminism up there, anti-essentialist feminism, and post-colonial feminism. And what all these strands of feminist thought have in common is kind of a refusal to think of social reality and social phenomena just in terms of um, gendered relations or male-female binary. So whereas a lot of second, what we call second-wave feminist theorizing focused on the male-female binary, you had kind of a newer wave of feminist thinking that said, you know, wait a minute, 
Um, women come from many different walks of life and a lot of different backgrounds. They're not just affected by gender, but in fact, their gender experiences are mediated by their race identity, by their cultural identity, by their sexual orientation, by their ability, by their age, and how all these differences are perceived in society and all the oppressions that attend to those differences. And so it might make more sense to think about you know, women's experience, not as some universal, but more particularized and historicized to the impacts that multiple points of difference can make in a person's life. And so the tenets of uh, this variety of feminist thinking that talks about intersectionality is that it's better when we're analyzing a social problem or a social phenomena not to think of just one um, issue or one focus of difference, but to look at multiple social axes in conjunction, in tandem with each other. And that's where you get the metaphor idea of the intersection that's attributed to the work of Kimberly Crenshaw um, in critical race feminism in law. But also you have many different feminists in different disciplines raising the same type of idea. And so the tenets are just um, understanding how the uh, differences interact together, that it's a more productive analysis if we look at social reality, reality that way for the most part, that oppressions actually shape one another. So it's hard to do, and it's kind of um, uh, false, uh, a false exercise or a misleading exercise to think of, let's say, racism in separation from speciesism or in separation from sexism. And because all of these nodes of difference that make up these oppressions are um, uh, more often than not cohering together, they're mutually co-constituting one another rather than on parallel tracks. Okay, so let's just take an example of this. An example I have is you know, the Abu Ghraib incident that we're all quite familiar with, I would imagine, from the pictures that circulated in uh, 2004 afterward um, about the uh, uh, prisoner torture and abuse at the Iraqi uh, prison by the American soldiers. And so I just want to use this example to show how one might perform an intersectional analysis that understands differences as connected. So when we first see these pictures, we might um, think about you know, the gendered elements um, and per perhaps even put our mind to how sexual orientation and homophobia informs the um, kind of acts that went on in terms of the staging of the photos and the sexual acts that the soldiers um, made the prisoners perform. And to see that, you know, homophobia and, um, you know, sexualization, kind of feminization of the um, Iraqi men were very prominent in, you know, what informed and what motivated the soldiers to act the way they did. Um, but, you know, to really understand the Abu Ghraib incident, many commentators have argue that you really have to go further and add a culture and race dimension. Because if you consider that the whole purpose of like the visual spectacle, of the circulation of the photos, of the leaking of the photos, is to stage a certain type of humiliation that creates, you know, fortifies a boundary between us and them, that the sexualized elements here, the gendered elements here, really work in conjunction with race and culture to kind of foster that idea of a civilizational clash. Right of the as a, as homopho as a homosexual acts as a way of showing the deviance of you know another culture of a non-Western culture as well as you know um, uh, harnessing the ideologies we have about you know Iraqi men about Islam and what is Islam's response might be to homosexual acts to gay and lesbian activism to kind of channel a further type of humiliating moment in that ideology about what would really psychologically and physically cause trauma and abuse to the detainees. So many commenters talked about the type of um, race thinking that was really important to the Abu Ghraib incident. And it's not just a matter of sexuality or sex or um, even um, uh, gender. What a lot of commentators, though, didn't talk about was the species element, right? So let me just give you an example here of one prominent Canadian commentator, Shireen Razak, who's a critical race feminist. And for Raza, she took Abu Ghraib and she takes Guantanamo Bay as, as um, you know, many uh, commentators do, as current day examples of what are called states of exception. And so this is drawing on theoret theoretical work by Giorgio Agamben um, the, that talks about kind of places that we create through law to be deliberately without law. So if you think of the kind of legal rhetoric the political rhetoric around the war on terror. You know, how do we justify a place like Guantanamo Bay? 
we say that you know the rule of law needs to be upheld, and we do that by denying civil liberties in a specific area in order to protect freedom and the rule of law elsewhere. And so we all know that there are these lawless zones where people are denied human um, treatment or denied civil liberties that we normally associate with the law. And why do we let that continue? Because Shreen Razak says, you know, states of exception aren't new. Um, they've been with us in history. But what's new about them today is the race thinking that informs, right? Because we're kind of um, uh, told and come to agree with and become complicit with ideologies about us and them, mediated by race and cultural difference, we accept that, yes, these people are different and must be treated this way in order to protect what's dearest to us freedom and the rule of law. So for Razak, when she talks, she gives her intersectional analysis, looking at sex, gender, culture, and race, and thinking about Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo, she defines race thinking, and this is her definition from her book, Casting Out, as the denial of a common bond of humanity between people of European descent and those who are not. And then she says, the logic of states of exception can be defined as follows. They are not simply contemporary excesses born of the West's current quest for security, but instead represent a more ominous, permanent arrangement of who is and who is not part of the human community. So I've underlined the human and humanity words in her definitions, because she herself, like many humanist thinkers who are very critical about other types of oppressions, doesn't really unpack the species element. Right? But if we go back even though it's so inherent to what she wants to say about race. But if we go back to the picture here of Lindy England, you see the leash and you know what that extends to in terms of the prisoner, you can very easily see how the species element, the whole animalization and idea of animality was so important to what happened in Abu Ghraib, right? So my argument would be to you know, understand Abu Ghraib is not just a matter of these more humanist-centered differences, that humanist thinkers are used to talking about, the thinking of species as well. Okay. So intersectionality you know, asks the question, are we getting a complete picture when we look at a particular social problem? And just as we might say, children, these are children looking at a zoo exhibit, you know, aren't getting the real picture about how the lives of animals in captivity are led, intersectional theory would say we're missing key components of analysis when we just focus on a single issue rather than multiple differences. OK. So on to the second point. So you know, I've just kind of offered a critique of um, uh, critical thinkers outside of animal issues and how they um, forget to advert to species difference in unpacking the types of social uh, phenomena that they want to unpack. So now we're going to turn to thinking about how you know, animal advocacy uh, typically does not incorporate intersectional thinking either, but rather runs as well on more parallel thinking. So if we think about you know, how are differences other than species, so, so how are differences like race or sex or culture or sexual identity, gender identity, how do those differences get factored into animal law, if at all? The answer I'm suggesting is primarily through parallel thinking, not an intersectional analysis. And the first type of parallel thinking that we see, for those of us who read a lot of like the theoretical animal ethics, animal law literature, if you see more of the animal rights um, or animal welfare uh, kind of um, uh, organizational literature as well, you may have come across quite frequently parallels between sexism, racism, and speciesism, right? And that's very influential in Peter Singer's um, influential account uh, in Animal Liberation, where he talks about what speciesism is and tries to show us the logic of this type of oppression through parallels with sexism and racism, right? So to the extent we're against taking a supposedly an uh, important biological difference, whether it's sex-based or race, we see it as race-based, and attributing um, identities, attributing attitudes, attributing norms, and creating a prejudice. We should also have that similar response when it's um, a species biological difference. And in practice, this type of parallel is also important in certain types of campaigns. We see it in PETA's work, right, with respect to their slavery analogies and their Holocaust analogies. And we also see it in the recent um, Sea World 13 Amendment case about the 13th Amendment and slavery being extended to the orcas. So just to remind ourselves, we have um, paragraph from the opening submission of the case about Tilikum and the other orcas um, and the uh, claim that the 13th Amendment be interpreted 
right, to prohibit slavery um, against orcas as well. So that type of, of oppression parallel, making parallels between different types of oppressions. And here the litigation is suggesting that the situation of the orcas today is slavery under the 13th Amendment, which came out of the more African-American experience in the United States. Um, so just um, moving on to another type of uh, parallel thinking in animal advocacy, we have trait parallels. And whereas parallel, um, the oppression parallels talk about similarities and overlaps and continuities between various forms of oppression, the trait parallels actually um, uh, sublimate difference altogether and you know, uh, reach for sameness, do a sameness type of move in terms of, hu in terms of trying to humanize animals into the human world. So this is also a very popular way of arguing for animals, where we emphasize those capacities and skills of animals that we value in humans and that morally and legally. And so these could be the cognitive skills of animals, int intellectual capacities, also the emotional capacities get talked about as well, as well as the cultural capacities or skills, ability of you know, certain types of animals to transmit culture intergenerationally, if we think of orcas or think of elephants. And so if, for those of us who were there yesterday for Jane's um, uh, comments about the LA elephant bullhook case, right? And she read out when she um, found the paragraph about uh, the judges, you know, uh, really strong and um, uh, unique comments about the intelligence of animals and anyone who thinks that that type of animal can lead a proper life in captivity is delusional. That's a classic example, right, of, of, of emphasizing what is similar to humans, what is valued in humans, and saying where animals have it, we should also respect that. So in theory, uh, Tom Regan's work is um, in this mold when he talks about his subject of the life. And a prominent campaign right now going forward is a non-human rights project, which makes these types of arguments. So here's a mission statement of an, uh, the non-human rights project. Uh, again, it's a project right, seeking to change the legal thinghood, um, to use Steve Wise's phrase, the legal thinghood of animals, um, so that they may be recognized as persons. Um, where, and if you look at the bottom part, which is highlighted in blue, uh, where they can have rights to which evolving standards of morality, scientific discovery, and human experience entitle them. And when you link the statement with the specific goals of the non-human rights project, and here are some of the goals from, taken from their website, you can see the highlighted in blue that you know, the uh, project is very directed at changing the minds of judges and persuading American state high courts to recognize personhood for specific and appropriate animals. And you can see in paragraph six that one of the specific goals is to talk about cognition um, capacities and to educate um, judges and wider community about cognition. So that's an example of trade parallels. Okay, so part three. You know, what, if anything, are the problems with this type of parallel thinking? You know, why perhaps might an intersectional um, analysis, intersectional thinking, be more productive uh, for coalition building or even just for more accurate analysis? Well, let's go back to the oppression parallels and recall the, the Tillicum case. Uh, a 13th Amendment case. You know, is it offensive? So, you know, when PETA had its popular, uh, prominent campaigns on slavery and as well as the Holocaust, and when this um, litigation was going forward, there were, you know, commentaries in the media from the NAACP and otherwise about, you know, these um, analogies being offensive, right? And so, we may understand that as like a, a knee-jerk kind of reactionary. Um, uh, response from uh, a, uh, an organization or an individual who is not normally attentive to animals and is um, are operating from a purely humanist premise and, and totally unwilling to see animals as morally mattering in any way, kind of equivalent to humans. Okay, and so we may then be tempted, um, you know, want to put that uh, objection aside. But let's imagine that that's not the source of the objection and think, you know, are there other types of um, factors here about why these analogies might be problematic if we, if we apply an intersectional analysis to the analogy drawing rather than just go with the parallel thinking. Uh, so the first point we may deduce is that you know, these simple analogies, right, so the conditions of orcas today is equivalent to um, African-American slavery in the United States, 
and may eclipse a larger picture actually what slavery was. So if we think again of what intersectional theory tells us, that differences are mutually co-constituting, we can take the American example of slavery and see that it's not just a matter of race, pure and simple. Right? Race itself was highly mediated by the idea of species. right? And so the um, dehumanization that occurred to allow African Americans to be enslaved and to have that make sense was very much a story about species and animalization. So just to posit an analogy kind of eclipses the nuances of what slavery actually was. That's one response. The other response in an intersectional approach might point to perhaps the you know, impression of opportunism that the analogy um, uh, gives rise to. So if we think of the larger animal advocacy context, and it may come across you know, as a movement, at least in Canada and the United States, that is a, a white movement or a largely white movement, right? That kind of operates typically through ideas of privilege that are not investigated, and that actually doesn't talk that much about systemic racism. And perhaps many of the adherents don't understand systemic racism um, and the current manifestations thereof. So to go back to the, you know, one of the few examples that Amer mainstream Americans will understand is systemic racism in the United States, historical slavery, and using an occurring campaign, may be you know, too much to bear in terms of opportunism uh, without like, a concomitant sense of seeing the current manifestations of um, racism today. When you add to this the fact that where, when animal issues usually invoke ideas of race in the media and media reports on it, race is usually pathologized, right? So if you think of anti-cruelty legislation, um, uh, going from the earlier panel comments today and yesterday, cruelty is a very specific concept which excludes mainstream norms from any type of um, legal scrutiny. What, in fact, anti-cruelty legislation targets is typically the aberrant actions of individuals or what is seen to the mainstream to be outside the norm and the practices of cultural communities. So the Santeria case right, in the United States is a very iconic example of that type of community targeting. So if you know, race is typically pathologized such that minority communities are seen as less animal friendly than majority communities, Right? And then you have a larger context where race is not really adverted to and other differences aren't talked about. The slavery analogy can then take on a different kind of um, tenor that is not perhaps intended, but that's why it causes concern. The remedy of this might just be avoidance of simple analogies and opportunism. And I tend to agree with Jane from her comments yesterday that a lot of this depends on like a lot of this work can't be done in short legal submissions, but in the outside external messaging that goes around a case. And so finally, what's wrong with trait parallels? If we take, you know, going back to our example of the non-human rights project goals, you know, is that offensive? Um, and here the problem lies, kind of pro the intersectional kind of um, problem when we don't think of uh, you know, the, if we don't, don't un unpack trait parallels, lies within our community, like really saliently, because trait parallels promote sameness thinking, not a respect for difference, right? And the sameness thinking about, you know, emotional intelligence, intelligence per se, cultural intelligence, those are all anthropocentric benchmarks. It takes what's exalted in human behavior and, and what has mer uh, mattered historically and tries to extend that ambit, the purview of all those markers over certain animals. As many feminists, critical race theorists, post-colonial theorists, queer theorists, disability rights theorists have talked about, these anthropocentric benchmarks actually only ever capture this idea of a paradigmatic human. You know, most human beings don't even function like that, and there are a lot of humans who don't meet those benchmarks, so it's exclusionary. This can be seen as um, especially exclusionary on species grounds because it's trying to take a humanist concept and extend it. The remedy here might be instead of you know, promoting and trying to get animals to fit into a human mold of intelligence and cognition, is to you know, not discount those capacities where they arise, let's say in the elephant case, but then also to talk about the markers of beingness that have typically been devalued you know, under Western cultural and intellectual traditions. Uh, the whole idea of the body and embodiment. Whereas embodiment and the idea of bodily associations was always stigmatized, instead, if you talk about kind of general suffering or the general aliveness of a being, and that's why it's important to you know, think of that being flourishing rather than you know, they can think a certain way or even that they can feel to a certain standard, 
that might be more um, in line with progressive kind of transformative thinking than the trade parallels. And so one last comment, you know, what does all of this mean for projects that aim for personhood, like the Non-Human Rights Project? Um, again, uh, legal personhood is a liberal concept. The common law idea of the person is a liberal concept, and liberalism um, doesn't do so well with difference. It's more of a sameness type of theory that values sameness rather than difference. So it's this concern that personhood is still an anthropocentric concept that values paradigmatic norms such that different types of beings, whether in the human realm, whether as you know, in the kind of technological realm of personhood, um, like corporations or like new intele uh, intellectual property, or whether in the non-human realm of animals or plants, uh, other types of beings, they don't easily fit into the mold of the person because the person has been born out of and brought up in a humanist paradigm. So as we're embarking on these projects, you know, like the Non-Human Rights Project or other projects that are thinking about how can we get better legal protection for animals actually an anti-exploitation end, right? How, can, how do we get to an abolitionist end for animals? It might be an opportune moment, I'm suggesting, to rethink whether personhood as a legal category is the best route to do that. You know, personhood has a historical baggage that may, may not be helpful. And you know, is it really a transformative concept or more of an incrementalist concept? And is it even necessary to put like our hopes and dreams and aspirations for animals in that older type of language rather than, let's say, a newer type of language? Thank you. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, my forthcoming book, which is on the topic of race and species. Um, in recent years, passionate disputes have sprung up in the US over how racialized others make use of animals in their practices. We've seen battles over horse tripping and cockfighting by Mexican immigrants, dog eating by Asian immigrants, whale hunting by native peoples, dog fighting by urban blacks, animal sacrifice by the Santeria, and more. Um, my book, forthcoming book by the title of the talk, um, looks at some of these conflicts and deconstructs the occasionally vitriolic and always illuminating discourses that they generate about race, species, and nature in an age shaped by both multiculturalist assumptions and neoliberal imperatives. The main case that I look at in the book is the battle that has unfolded over the past few decades over the live animal markets in San Francisco's Chinatown, the nation's oldest Chinatown and the symbolic heart of Chinese America. Since the 1990s, animal advocates who are mostly white have sought to regulate or shut down the markets on the grounds that they keep and kill turtles, frogs, birds, and fish cruelly. The Chinese American community, a growing powerhouse in San Francisco life and politics, has vigorously defended the sale of live animals as a vital part of Chinese culture and has denounced the campaign as an expression of racism and cultural imperialism. I also look at two other conflicts in the book, the uproar over the arrest and conviction of NFL quarterback Michael Vick, who is black on dogfighting charges in 2007, and the controversy over the decision by the Macaw, a native people in northwest Washington state, to resume whale hunting in the mid-1990s after a hiatus of 70 years. Uh, today, because of time constraints, I'm going to just talk about the Chinatown case. So what I suggest in the book is that we look at these conflicts as sites where race, species, nature, and culture are produced and vigorously contested by various interested parties. Critical theorists and feminist theorists in many fields have shown us that differences are made, not given, and that they are produced as effects of power in a profoundly interdependent way. So going back to what Manisha was just speaking about, um, if we consider the dualisms that form powerful undercurrents in Western culture, um, power produces differences through these dualisms and is in turn reproduced by them. What gives them their force, in part, is that they are co-constituted and mutually reinforcing, as Val Plumwood, Donna Haraway, and McClintock and others have discussed. The black person is made in the Western imagination, not just as not white, but as animal, savage, nature, other, body, object, alien, and slave. I'm especially interested in here in what I call the conjoined logics of race and species, and how interdependent and mutually referential these two particular taxonomies of power are, and how profoundly they shape what, whom we consider to be 
in Judith Butler's words, a grievable life. Um, in addition to interpreting what these conflicts mean, I'm also interested in thinking through the ethical dilemmas that they pose, since they appear to ask us to choose between the interests of racialized others and the interests of animals. So let me mention a few concepts that I introduce in the book to help us think through uh, this problem. The first is what I call single optic vision, which refers to a way of seeing that foregrounds a particular form of injustice and backgrounds others. So it brings one type of injustice into focus and puts others out of focus, makes one type visible and others less visible. When we see through a single optic or lens, cruelty to animals, ecological harm, racism, or something else. We see, but we also do not see. And these two facts are, of course, interconnected. So every claim of oppression involves certain kinds of illusions. And every act of illumination involves a corresponding act of obscuring. Single optic vision is the default mode of vision for most social justice struggles. And in conflicts like the ones that I'm looking at in my book, where an either or zero sum dynamic emerges, it leads to what I call an ethics of disavowal or a denial of connection with and dismissal of the other form of injustice being raised. So what I propose that we develop instead is the practice of multi-optic seeing, which offers a way to engage disparate justice claims in a way that takes them all seriously without privileging anyone presumptively. Jeremy Bentham's pan-opticon erected a single privileged external vantage point from which to surveil inmates, patients, and other powerless wards of the state. By contrast, multi-optic seeing entails seeing from within various perspectives, shifting back and forth among vantage points, inhabiting them in turn. So this form of seeing decenters any single set of justice claims and thereby resists the temptation to arrange claims in a hierarchy of importance. By refusing the seductive simplicity of a single optic storyline, multi-optic seeing offers a method for apprehending the articulated dimensions of domination in all of their messiness and moral complexity. If single optic reading asks us to choose which optic is more important in these conflicts, um, racism or speciesism, multi-optic reading asks us to see not only the importance of both, but to grasp their profound interconnections as mutually constituted expressions of power. This kind of seeing has the potential to reorient us toward an ethics of avowal or an open and active acknowledgement of connection. Instead of that has nothing to do with me, this matters to me and relates to me. An ethics of avowal is an openness to the suffering of others, an engagement with others in the fullness of their being. So I'll come back to that idea at the end of my talk. So, um, <clears throat> Now, I know that the, the map on the left was actually put there on the slide for an Australian audience. I know you all know where San Francisco is <laughs> in the United States, but I didn't want to presume for the Australians. But OK, so on the right, we see um, San Francisco, and uh, Chinatown is up in the very top right-hand corner. Um, OK, so Chinatown was created during the original settlement of Chinese laborers in California during the gold rush in the mid-1800s and is a place with a bitter and storied past, a site of extraordinary efforts at racial exclusion historically, and a site, too, of ongoing community resilience. Recent waves of immigration from China, Hong Kong, Vietnam, and elsewhere have maintained Chinatown as an enclave for low-skilled, limited English proficient immigrants of little means, while waves of Chinese capital have helped to expand middle-class Chinese residential patterns and business ownership far beyond Chinatown into other city districts, particularly the Richmond and Sunset. Despite the touristy glitz, Chinatown is in effect a ghetto with all the problems of a ghetto. Substandard housing, overcrowding, inadequate services, poverty, and more. Everyone who lives there aspires to leave, and those who can do, yet they do return to it to shop and socialize and touch base with their Chineseness. Worldwide trade stocks Chinatown shops with live animals, animal parts, herbs, and other food and medicinal products from China. So today, San Francisco's Chinatown is a product of global flows of capital, goods, and human and animal bodies. In Chinatown's live animal markets, animals are commodified and instrumentalized. Their needs, interests, desires ignored. Merchants place chickens and other birds in wire cages so small they can barely stand, barely move, and often cannot reach food or water when these are made available. <clears throat> 
They keep frogs and turtles uh, several layers high in bins, which result in some in the bottom being crushed or suffocated. They place fish in densely packed tanks or leave them flopping in a few inches of water, struggling to breathe. In these shots, we see a fish flopping around out of water and a worker shoving a bat in its mouth and lifting it up to show the customer that it is still breathing, fresh food. Merchants kill chickens by strangulation or by slitting their throats. They kill fish by chopping their heads off, frogs by skinning them alive or putting them in a plastic bag and just smashing it with a mallet. They kill turtles by cutting their shells off and disemboweling them, decapitating them, or cutting them in half with a bandsaw. Sometimes turtles are left with parts of their bodies cut open or cut off until another customer comes along and claims the remaining part. These are the conditions that moved a loose coalition of activists from various animal groups to charge the Chinese vendors with cruelty and ask the San Francisco Commission on Animal Control and Welfare to ban the sale of live animals in the city. By treating turtles, birds, frogs, and fish, in the words of one advocate, lesser creatures, as in some ways grievable as individual lives that mattered, they opened themselves up to ridicule from the media, Chinese activists, and even other animal advocates. <clears throat> Chinese American activists retorted that live food is central to Chinese cuisine and culture and a tradition that goes back for over a thousand years in the homeland. Freshly killed meat, they aver, is not only more flavorful, but more energizing, more nutritious, and has more medicinal properties. The only way to know that meat is fresh is to buy an animal live and kill it yourself or watch as it is killed in the market. Chinese ad activists advanced an optic of racism and cultural imperialism arguing that animal advocates were targeting them because they were Chinese. So in this quote, a Chinese American activist, Rose Chai, suggests that animal advocates are imposing a double standard on the Chinese community. So you can kind of skim through it. Um, are we so sure that if cameras were to roam the slaughterhouses and meat factories that produce and supply the neatly packaged meat we buy at supermarkets that the conditions would not offend the sensitivities of many of us? Um, and further down, if San Francisco as a city wants to take on the issue of cruelty to animals, let it do so in a consistent manner. We should require certification and inspection of industries that supply meat for sale in the city. We should not focus only on the more visible targets. <clears throat> Here we see two prominent Chinese American elected officials deploying the optic of racism. Uh, Leland Yi, San Francisco Board of Supervisors at the time, when you target just Chinese merchants, you have to be out of your mind not to see it as racially motivated. And then Tom Shea, I must, um, also Board of Supervisors, I must take offense at some of the short-sighted comments directed toward our community. They disrespect our traditions, cultures, and values. Supervisor Tom Shea held a press conference where he passed out photocopies of San Francisco municipal reports from the 1870s denigrating the Chinese, thus asserting a direct link between the anti-Chinese agitation of the exclusion era and the market campaign of the 1990s. Arguing that the campaign was a threat not just to Chinatown merchants, but to all Chinese people living in the US, activists with the help of the Chinese language media used the issue to mobilize a sense of community among Chinese Americans. In the Chinatown story, I suggest that race matters in ways that go unnamed by the optic of racism, which focuses on racial targeting and persecution, that is, on acts of racial animus. As a taxonomy of power, race also generates persistent tropes that are structuring features of our imaginative matrix in the US. So here I have in mind the centuries old trope about Chinese cruelty and transgressiveness. This trope may be inescapable in that things that, ha that have to do with the Chinese become culturally legible to us through the trope. It may be that we can only read these events this way. In the Chinatown story, it's not the animal activists, but elements of the media and the public who link the activist charges of cruelty to ongoing representations of Chinese culture as cruel and transgressive, and treat them as evidence of the Chinese people's stubborn refusal to assimilate to American ways. The fictional drama of the racialized other's putative refusal of Americanness displaces the real drama of how Chinese Americans continue to be foreignized in ways that restrict their life chances. The trope of Chinese cruelty and transgressiveness is as old as Chinatown itself, which was from the beginning a place of white fear and loathing and desire, a hidden alien space where inscrutable Asiatics 
engaged in unspeakable subversive activities. Nyan Shah points out that disease and pollution were central themes. Public health officials often described Chinatown as a plague spot and a cesspool. And just as the stench and contagion were barely contained within Chinatown, always threatening to spill over racial, spatial, and class boundaries to endanger the body politic, so was decadent Chinese culture resistant to, and thus a threat to, the dynamic progressivism of the American nation. The cruelty and transgressiveness of the Chinese have been linked to animality with great consistency. The strange animals they eat has always been a leading index of the otherness of the Chinese. As early as 1855, just six years after the gold rush began, minstrel show singers performed this song, John Chinaman. Um, and then I highlighted just the one stanza. I thought of rats and puppies, John, you'd eaten your last fill, but on such slimy pot pies, John, I'm told you dinner still. This trade card for the rat poison rough on rats from California in the 1870s features a Chinaman eating a rat. The slogan, they must go, which is in very small type over his head, is of course an echo of the call, the Chinese must go, the rallying cry of the agitation that ultimately led to the 1882 Exclusion Act. Both rats and the Chinese, amassing hordes intent upon the destruction of Western civilization, are pestilential invading vermin to be exterminated without mercy. In recent years, as Americans have watched China's ascendancy as a global financial, military, and manufacturing power, the trope of Chinese cruelty and transgressiveness and the corollary theme of animality have persisted. Americans today imagine the Chinese as selfish and ruthlessly exploitative toward animals and the environment, using endangered animals and traditional Chinese medicine, generating pollution that harms the planet. As selfish and reckless regarding the health of others, manufacturing poison pet food and painting children's toys with lead, and cruelly indifferent to human rights, the one-child policy, infanticide, political prisoners. That is, they imagine the Chinese as a foil to the humane, rights-respecting, law-abiding, democratic nation they perceive the U.S. to be. When the SARS epidemic of 2003 was traced to the live animal markets of Guangdong, where a viral disease of zoonotic origins had jumped the species barrier and infected humans, Chinese toxicity seemed to have been unleashed, unleashed at last across the globe. At the behest of animal activists, the San Francisco Com Commission on Animal Control and Welfare held eight months of public hearings on the live animal market issue in 1995 and advised the Board of Supervisors to enact a ban on the sale of live animals for food. But the Chinese American community had enough political clout to prevent the board from acting. Animal advocates then tried a different approach, asking the California Fish and Game Commission in the state capital of Sacramento to ban the importation of live turtles and frogs this time on the grounds that these animals sometimes get released or find their way into the wild, where they act as invasive species who harm native species of frogs and turtles through predation, competition, and disease. The Fish and Game Commission, in an almost farcical display of bureaucratic foot dragging, obfuscation, and delay, held public hearings, consulted scientific experts, and debated the matter on and off for 13 years before finally voting in 2010 to recommend a ban, which would have ceased the annual importation of 2 million bullfrogs raised commercially in Taiwan and over 300,000 freshwater turtles taken from the wild in the southeastern United States, although it turned out once again that Chinese Americans had enough political clout to stop the proposed ban in its tracks. But if policy didn't change, and turtles and frogs continued to be imported for sale in the markets. The fish and game hearings were nevertheless incredibly revealing as a site of discursive contestation over race, species, and nature. To begin with, the Fish and Game Commission's official discourse shows in a stark manner the penetration of neoliberal language into and the marketization of state discussions of environmentalism, in particular through the rendering of the wild animal as a resource. The Fish and Game's very name, of course, which has recently been changed to Fish and Wildlife, um, suggests a reading of the wild animal through its utility for humans as game. Commissioners present themselves as stewards who use the best possible science to neutrally manage the state's living natural resources for the good of the whole. But the universalism and scientism of Fish and Game discourse mask the commission's sanctioning of the commodification and instrumentalization of nature and the fact that these processes tend to benefit those with race and class privilege, not the whole. A key part of Fish and Game's neoliberal lexicon has to do with so-called alien invasives, 
Although alien invasives are defined as those who cause harm to particular ecosystems, biologists emphasize ecosystems are in constant flux, which makes the invasives designation arbitrary. And it is clear that invasives become labeled as such primarily when they specifically threaten human economic interests, which makes the designation political. Additionally, invasives are consistently racialized, a trend so marked that some scholars have started to worry about bio-xenophobia and biological nativism on the part of scientists who write on these issues. Again, we see the conjoined logics of race and species. Before, we saw species serving as a repository of meaning for the construction of Chineseness. Here, we see the directional arrow reversed, and race serves as a repository of meaning for the construction of species. Jean and John Komaroff observe that the racialization of so-called invasives reflects deep neoliberal anxieties about boundaries and belonging in an age of global migration. Constrained by fish and game discourse, animal advocates advance the optic of ecological harm caused by invasives, ironically making the turtles and frogs they had previously characterized as victims in the markets now the aggressors who needed to be contained. Karen Benzel in of Indefensive Animals, um, a national animal protection organization, gave a presentation at a fishing game hearing uh, that I've excerpted. So on her PowerPoint slide, non-native, never good. The next slide, who pays? Taxpayers. Native populations fighting non-natives for their survival. Benzel, you have the power to say no more, no more excuses, no further delay. Slide, you have the evidence, you have the responsibility, you have the power, laws are being broken, your own regulations ignored. Non-natives are not good. They are usually ecological disasters in almost every case. Someone is going to make money, like the pet trade, but it won't be you. You will end up cleaning up the mess, wasting time and resources that should have been spent protecting California's wildlife, not bringing more in. Make the decision, make it now, make non-natives illegal. Race is not mentioned in Benzel's presentation, but the language unmistakably mirrors conservative rhetoric about illegal Mexican immigrants entering the US and threatening the safety and solvency of real Americans. When the Fish and Game Commission voted in 2010 at last, after 13 years, to enact a ban on importing the turtles and frogs for food, the issue of race, which had been sidelined in the hearings, came back with a vengeance. At the next Fish and Game hearing, um, several Asian American elected officials showed up in person, which was unprecedented, to argue against the ban and advance the optic of racism. Here is an excerpt of an exchange between one of the Fish and Game Commissioners and one of the Asian American elected officials during this meeting. You'll see it's a face-off between the optic of ecological harm and the optic of racism. So Commissioner Dan Richards starts with um, the states being permeated with invasive species. Um, Ted Luth then says, this dis decision is discriminatory. I have not seen it that it is these operators that cause the invasive species problem. There is no evidence that they have caused this problem. Um, I urge you to reverse the decision. It is discriminatory on its face. Richards, I must tell you, Assemblyman Liu's comments on discrimination infuriated me because that is exactly the politics that enter into these decisions that should never enter into it. It's got nothing to do with discrimination, and he knows that. I find that offensive to this commission who works so hard to make the right decisions. But anyway, I see no need to change what we've already done. And candidly, it just puts on our radar screen, radar screen that we need to now expand it and continue our, and I'm going to call it a war, for lack of a better word, on the invasive species that are decimating our native wildlife. <clears throat> to Commissioner Richards, Liu's invocation of race is special pleading, the inappropriate injection of politics or particular interests into the proceedings. To Liu, on the other hand, the commissioner's universalist posture is a cover for reproducing white privilege, a set of particular interests posturing as general interests. Single optic vision slides seamlessly into an ethics of disavowal in the course of this conflict. In San Francisco's Chinatown, animal advocates did not make racially denigrating comments about the Chinese. They did not trash Chinese culture. They did not valorize American culture over Chinese culture. But nor did they intentionally invoke or evoke persistent negative tropes about the Chinese. They focused quite narrowly on the market practices at hand. But they did claim that their campaign had nothing to do with race suggesting that race can be bracketed, that a discursive political space can be carved out where we can make claims without racial implications. This claim of colorblindness is itself a profound disavowal 
of the fact that racial power saturates every aspect of US society, of the fact that there is no race-free space. It is a claim by which, by which one signals a desire not to have to deal with race, even when one is surrounded on all sides by race. It is a claim of a kind of racial innocence that is not possible. For their part, Chinese leaders were openly dismissive of the animal issue. They derided the market campaign as ridiculous, saying animals raised for food don't deserve this kind of concern. They're going to die anyways. What's the problem? Chinese-American activist Rose Pack commented acerbically, animal advocates should really be helping the homeless or victims of pit bull maulings rather than worrying about animals raised for food. What's next, she said, worrying about vegetables? To Pack, worrying about turtles and frogs in the market was so preposterous, it was one step away from worrying about the welfare of bok choy. Human domination over animals and nature remains unmarked and normative, just as whiteness, maleness, middle-classness, and heterosexuality are all unmarked and normative. The disavowal of the animal issue is unapologetic and, and complete. It's easy to understand how we get to the point of mutual disavowal. We are, many of us, passionately concerned with a particular issue. And by seeking to bring it into focus, we necessarily, if unwittingly, put other issues out of focus. When it appears a zero-sum situation, we do what we think we need to do to advocate for our issue. What a multi-optic reading of the Chinatown story and other stories like it suggests is that this is not a strategy that we can afford. Is it reasonable to labor away in our separate silos and disavow one another while neoliberal capitalism is generating unheard of inequalities among human groups and unheard of planetary damage? The insight of intersectional analysis that dimensions of power are deeply conjoined calls for a broader political commitment to justice, not just justice for animals or justice for Asian Americans or justice for women, but a broader vision of a world wherein relations of exploitation and violence have been transformed into relations of respect and mutuality. Even this brief glimpse at the conjoined logics of race and species, two taxonomies that instrumentalize different bodies and convert them into disposable commodities, shows us that the struggle against racism and the struggle against speciesism, while not the same struggle, are not separable either. An ethics of avowal can grow out of such a recognition helping us to deeply see and avow the suffering of others as connected to our own. I want to go beyond an admonition about accountability or doing no harm to an exhortation to a sense of openness to others and engagement with others in the fullness of their being. Practically speaking, this wouldn't necessarily mean an end to the kinds of campaigns that I, I talk about in my book um, or an end to the race first response by these groups, but it would mean an end to these in their current form. We might ask ourselves, what would it look like if animal advocates in this case avowed concerns with racial marginalization? And what would it look like if Chinese community leaders avowed concerns with the moral considerability of animals? And what would it look like if both parties understood and acknowledged the profoundly conjoined relationship of these taxonomies? If Val Plumwood is right that the task ahead of us is developing a transformational politics that challenges the instrumentalizing stance that lies at the core of neoliberalism, Ch that if, if she's right that our task is to challenge the very logic of supremacist thinking and action, how can we refashion our scholarship and our activism today with this goal in mind? How can we contribute to this project by continuing the work that some have already begun in reimagining the human, the animal, and nature outside of relations of dominance? How do we enact justice in a multiracial, multi species world? Thank you. Thank you both for those incredibly thought-provoking presentations. We have time for a couple of questions, so if you can make your way to the microphones if you have a question. Hello. Uh, recently, the California legislature passed um, some limitations on the use of shark fins, and Governor Brown signed the bill. Do you have any comments on that uh, whole discussion? <laughs> 
Yes, thank you. I, I do discuss that in my book. So it, that appears to be a situation where the Chinese American community did not have the clout, right, to prevent the shark fin ban from passing. I think the key difference there, uh, there are two differences. One, why was it that, you know, why did the shark fin ban pass, but the live animal market issue um, flopped? Okay, so one major difference is the shark fin ban was sold to the public as an environmental issue, right? This is about our oceans, this is about our ecosystems. It was not about the sharks per se, cruelty to sharks. Um, the live animal market issue was more uh, presented mostly as a, as a cruelty issue. And I think Americans are, on the whole, more open to the environmental issue than they are to the cruelty issue. Um, also, the shark fin ban had many um, Chinese American proponents. One of the sponsors of the bill, Paul Fang, was, of course, Chinese American. And Yao Ming did a lot of, like, you know, ads uh, for, uh, for shark fins. So I think there were, um, there were different, um, you know, different sensibilities and, and agendas behind both projects. But one interesting thing it does point out is that the, the, China, the political cloud of the Chinese American community is not unlimited, right? Because there was a big push to try to stop this ban on the part of many Chinese American business people, and they, and they did fail. Lisa? Hi, thanks so much for being here. Um, so I, I'm guessing it's likely that most of us here are interested in considering ways of incorporating this intersectional thinking and multi-optic vision in, in the work that we do. And I'm wondering um, how we resist in our day-to-day work as advocates, you, you know, we also have this practical enterprise of trying to make immediate gains in the lives of animals who are on earth with us right now. And in doing that, we're often looking for the points of the greatest cultural leverage and certainly the points of the greatest legal leverage. And, you know, as you've pointed out, lots of times those points of legal leverage are, are based on the kind of parallel thinking or the single optic thinking that we're also trying to resist. So how do we how do we incorporate that kind of bigger scope in our day to day work without playing into the very oppression that we're trying to oppose? A great question. Um, my thoughts on that? Yes, thank you for the question. I think a big factor on um, coalition building is the impressions that uh, a movement can leave behind by the work it does. So if there is um, a consistency in taking on issues that attack kind of the majoritarian practices, which, you know, from the panels we've heard over the conference, we see all of those types of campaigns that are out there. Then when um, kind of a, uh, a controversy arises that gets more of a racialized play or another type of difference mediated play in, in the media, then at least there is that larger kind of repertoire of work that shows the commitments of the movement. But at the same time, when those moments of controversy arise that seem to um, bring forward that, you know, call for an intersectional analysis, it's interesting to think, like, what are the media releases of an organization? Like, what do they say? What do we respond to? You know, do we see that issue as another issue and not related? And so I would like encourage more types of media engagement from like animal organizations on these other issues, trying to forward a type of intersectional analysis. And on the day-to-day -day work, I mean, I think uh, it, it is about these, you know, this idea of like changing hearts and minds. A lot of it is like, you know, many of us on different issues have ideas in our head about, you know, who is more progressive or which country or culture or nation is like more um, forward on certain issue, not other issues. And that's not necessarily like accurate or true, and it comes from a, a certain type of education. And so when we see those comments, you know, you know, we're all on listservs, we're on social media, and we see that kind of commentary about, oh, how could they do this? How could you know we need to do this? I think that's a moment of everyday intervention as to who those they's and we's are. I, I, I think that's such, such a great question. Where are you? Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, there you are. Okay, um, it's such a good question, and I, I mean, I'm going to bring up the Michael Vick case, which I have a chapter on in my book, and as an example of how I would respond to that, I think it's. Um, I don't think that animal advocates need to stop criticizing minority groups for their animal practices. Right? I, that's definitely not the point of the book. The point of the book is to um, ask them to engage race when they encounter it. Right. So if you're going to take down Michael Vick for dog fighting, which I think people should then you need to engage the issue of race. You need to engage the way that he, as a um, black man from the projects, right, rose up and became this superstar and, and you know, a, a role model for many people in the black community. You need to address racial segregation in sports. You need to address um, how neoliberalism has created 
um, these barren inner cities where people have no opportunities, right, and where dogfighting seems like maybe a form of entertainment that it wouldn't to most of us. Um, you need to address these larger structural issues around race. To, and so what I think the, the key mistake animal advocates make is to say what we're doing has nothing to do with race. That is the mistake. Because yes, what you're doing has to do with race, whether you like it or not. So you either disavow it or you find a way to avow it. And I think it is possible to go after Michael Vick, to go after dogfighting, and still acknowledge and, and really engage the issues about racial marginalization of black people. Um, and, and I think it's possible to do both. And you know, the history of animal advocacy shows us that animal advocates, you know, they, they come from a tradition of caring deeply about child labor, or slavery, women's suffrage, right? I mean, that's the history of the movement. I think that's a, a history we can recapture. Um, let's take one more question, if we can. Um, before I put my question, I just want to say that culture is not race. And you can expect a culture to change or rise up to a more universal standard or higher standard without it being racist. But um, what I want to say is I'm a taxpayer, and I don't think I should have to underwrite animal research with the NIH, uh, the VA, um, state universities, or subsidies to agribusiness. And my question to you as a group is, do I have a case? Because I don't think I'm alone in this. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess as, as a litigator, I can say that uh, we certainly bring taxpayer actions where they're appropriate, but there needs to be something that underlying that's illegal. Just because you don't like where taxes are going doesn't give you a, a cause of action. But. Well, is there like a religious angle in this? Um, generally not, uh, if your religious beliefs are, um, if, if the law is one of general applicability, um, it's not generally considered a violation of the uh, free exercise clause to, to pay taxes oh, yeah. to something that you don't support. Okay, thank you. Sure. But that's not legal advice. <laughs> uh, the law is evolving always. So thank you all so much for coming. I hope this is...